So, welcome to the Deerfield Planning Board on April 12, 2021 at, well, I have 6.59, so maybe it's almost 7. I have 7. All right, Denise is Good to go. All right, <clears throat> meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternate means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the official order suspending provisions of our open meeting law. Um, and the meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Access or Frontier Community Access Television. We don't see that yet, but maybe they'll be coming. Um, and remote questions are voted on the website, uh, deerfieldma.us. So I'll begin with a roll call. Paul Ellis. No. <clears throat> Max Anthes. Max Anthes here. Hey, hi, Max. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine here. Hey, hi, Rachel. And Mary. Um, not yet, maybe. <laughs> Denise Mason. New space in here. And you know, if you're not talking, can you put your stuff on mute? Because someone's giving us a lot of feedback. Please. Got it. Hearing. Sorry. Uh, Kathy Wachroba. Oops, so who now is unmuting? Un Kathy Wachroba here. <laughs> Thank you, Emily Wolfel here. <clears throat> so we do have five people out of seven. So we do have a quorum. And Mary's here. Oh, Hi, good. Emily, I'm here. And Mary Cloutier here. There she is. Hi, Anne Mary. Thank you. Six people out of seven with our majority then for voting will be four. Um, so reviewing the mail, um, <clears throat> we did receive a letter from the Massachusetts Attorney General um, with issues regarding two warrants that we approved at our special town meeting last October. Our floodplain bylaw at the office. Pardon me? Oops, our, our floodplain bylaw. Um, we had an incorrect building code reference and on our marijuana overlay district zoning bylaw, we missed a legal posting. So <clears throat> actions have been taken by town hall staff to correct the postings. So you will see possibly even some other postings, some publications in the newspaper. Um, this is all in accordance with what the attorney general has requested <clears throat> so that um, it can then go forward and actually it'll be finalized within 20 days, 21 days of the final official posting. Um, Anybody have any questions about that or uh, elaborations from town? No. Okay, thank you. Minutes, Anne Mary. Um, I think that everyone has seen them, so I'm going to move to approve the minutes from um, April 5th. May I have a second? Denise is seconding. Denise, can you unmute? Glad I was muted when I responded. <laughs> yeah, I second it, Denise Mason. Um, just a point of question with open meeting laws. I mean, if we have questions, we can reply back when they, just to you. No, we just have to wait until we have discussion here. Okay, so are there any corrections then in our discussion? No, okay, so um, we'll change our alphabetical order a little bit. We'll start this time with Rachel for approval of the minutes. Uh, I, Rachel Blaine. And Mary? And Mary Cloutier, I. <clears throat> Denise? Denise Mason, I. Kathy? Kathy Wachova, I. Emily, I, and Max Antes. Max Antes, I. Okay, so the minutes are approved. Thank you. Um, old business. Um, the only thing, I, very little that I have here primarily, um, I believe, or at least as of this morning, <clears throat> we still need two more signatures on our 51 sugar loaf ANR. Um, the, the documents for signing have sort of um, come out sequentially rather than some of them being all at once. So um, for some of you who only signed one, um, we need some more signatures. And we also um, need one more 
signature on the special permit. So um, if you haven't been in to sign yet anything, we need these signatures ASAP. Yes, Anne Mary? Um, you were, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. If you're done with reminding everybody to go in, then I wanted to go back to mail because there was a piece of email that I think everybody got today and I wanted to make sure that everybody got it and call attention to it before we move on. Okay, let me just finish then with the discussion. Okay, sorry. Which isn't really old business, but um, a good reason to come in to um, <clears throat> sign the documents is um, we have a pretty hefty <clears throat> packet of information from Treehouse and they will be presenting at our next meeting and those also are on the table waiting to be picked up so um, <clears throat> if you it's a good reason you need to get in there early so you can start <laughs> reading <laughs> this um, and Mary um, maybe did I miss that what was if you would like to go forward with what that mail was and unless you're talking about for the accessory apartments yeah that yep Oh, okay. I was thinking we would address that during our accessory apartment. Fantastic. I just wanted to acknowledge that as a piece of that it came in as a piece of mail. Yeah, I. Uh, it's always nice to have a note in that. Um, does anyone else have any um, old business? I don't think so. For the, oh, Jen. I just wanted to say if anybody wants electronic copies of the treehouse application, I can also send that along if that's helpful. If you have a lot of space in your computer. <laughs> yeah. happy. Or just ask Sue and she can send it. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so let's move on now to our public hearing as we've had in the past for our um, public hearings on bylaws. Um, we will open the public hearing, then ask public members of the public to give comments. Um, hopefully they can be succinct um, and respectful of other comments that have been given. Um, if we start having a lot of uh, repetition, then we can, as a group, discuss closing the public hearing um, and then uh, when we do have our, um, we, we then could, at the end of our public hearing, we can either continue the public hearing, we can um, vote on um, deliberating some changes that are less restrictive than what had originally been posted and at which point then they, those, those pylons could go on to um, town warrant or if the bylaws that we're considering um, adjustments to are more restricted, we'll have to um, have a new public hearing. So I believe that's the process, if everyone's okay with that. All right, so I would like to open the public hearing, and this is a um, public hearing on our um, accessory apartment Bylaws. Chris Curtis is here. Chris, do you want to make any sort of introduction? Um, sure. So we have been working on um, a set of accessory apartment bylaw amendments, and um, a big part of this was to bring the town's bylaw into conformance with the new changes to the State Zoning Act, which specifically enabled um, accessory apartments to be permitted in communities and established some um, fairly clear definitions of terms for accessory apartment, including um, the um, size um, of, of apartments and other um, related uh, dimensional requirements. So the bylaw is an amendment to the town's existing um, bylaws to, uh, to achieve those kinds of goals and um, to set standards for all accessory apartments that are consistent with the, the state law. Thank you, Chris. Um, they have been reviewed by our town council. So I think we um, have passed that one. Um, was there a question? I'm missing that. 
No, that's just the, the background. Okay, um, so if we could have public hand uh, comments. I think there's few enough people that you can just raise your hand, <clears throat> like that, such as Robin Sherman. Robin, welcome. Hi, thanks very much for the opportunity to comment and thank you for your service. I sent an email earlier today, so I'm hopefully you all have that and I'm not going to go ahead and read it. Um, just by way of introduction, I, my husband Rob Allen and I own our property at 11 Juniper Drive, which we purchased in 2011, lived there full time till 2015 when we relocated out of state for both family and work reasons. Um, we live in Alaska. My husband's from here. We have elderly parents and relatives on both ends of the country and have been trying to balance that and our responsibilities to our family. Um, our long-term plan is always to come back to our property at 11 Juniper Drive, but it's taking us a little longer to do that than we had hoped or intended just for personal reasons. Um, in the past, we have long-term caretakers at our property um, who live there free of rent. Um, it's an arrangement that's worked out for both of us and you'll hear they're here on the call. So you'll hear from them. Um, it has worked out for us logistically and it's also important to us. We really wanna create affordable housing for other people in Deerfield. Um, in the past, we, when we have been on the East Coast to visit our family and to take care of our family, we've actually stayed on our property. Um, that's really no longer feasible due to the pandemic and to the fact that our caretakers now have a growing family of their own. We have been looking for an opportunity to create an accessory apartment for our own use at our property. The property is well suited for that. It is three acres. It's got three existing outbuildings and plenty of space. It would be easy to create an accessible apartment on our property without impacting any of the neighbors. And it really wouldn't be for rental. It would be for our own use so that we could come and go without disturbing um, our caretakers. Um, I think the accessory apartment is great. In general, I'm completely in favor of it. I do have a concern about the language that would require um, property owners to certify that they would be using, that the accessory apartment would be for use as their permanent or primary residence. And the reference to only absences to only for legitimate reasons, I think, or bona fide reasons. I think, you know, the town doesn't really wanna be in the business of determining how often property owners are staying on their own property and whether they're absent for legitimate reasons and how much time they're absent for. So I would just ask that you consider a slight revision to the bylaw. I don't have any problem saying that one of the apartments or one of the units on the property has to be for the owner's use. So effectively you can only rent one of them. And then if your goal is to limit the use, to limit short-term rentals, you can just add that as you know a part of the special permit. So if you don't want the unit that is for the owner's use to be used as a short-term rental, you could require specific approval for that and put conditions on it. So that's really what I had to say. It would be very helpful if you could pass this with this change. It would give us the opportunity to use our property and still have our caretakers there, which is good for them and good for us and is creating affordable housing. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> um, we have, I think what we will do is accept all of the public comments or would the planning board prefer to ask questions after each one? Why don't we then go forward with more public comments and and then we'll have discussion. Okay, other comments? No, okay. Oh, Chris, all right, Chris. Yeah, I was, I was just waiting for others, sorry. Um, no, I had, to, I had only flagged two things in this and no, number one was in 3934, four, which um, the previous, um, uh, resident talked about in terms of except for bona fide uh, temporary absences 
I mean, it, it's kind of a catch-all phrase, but it can be a little vague and it can get into like this gray area. And so her suggestion that that be folded into um, the special permit process maybe makes sense. It's a little bit um, edgy there. But then in six and seven, there might be, uh, and, and uh, Chris Curtis can look at this, there might be a little redundancy in six and seven because it report, refers to 50% of the area and then it refers to 900 and or the mid. I think there's a redundancy between the two clauses in 39, 34, six and seven. Otherwise, I thought it was pretty good. Okay, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Nate? Sure, thanks um, for the opportunity to come here. I recognize um, where I'm coming from. I'm, uh, I'm living uh, in, in Robin and Rob's house on Juniper Drive. Um, and yeah, so my wife and I are residents of Deerfield. We're both students and been lucky enough to find this um, caretaking opportunity um, in exchange um, for, for you know, living here and to caretaking the property. And it's really the only way that um, both of us have been able to afford living in New York students. Um, we now have like a, we have a three month old daughter um, and we love living here. I work here. Um, and I, my generation of peaking is a 30 something. We haven't had the fortune um, that my parents' generation has brought ownership. And I think um, this ability that the town has to create opportunities for more affordable housing um, through accessory dwelling um, would be a real benefit to um, a lot of us younger folk who are trying to live here and ultimately own our own uh, homes. I support the bylaw. I, I do. I do support it with the revision that Robin mentioned earlier. So that's all for me. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Jennifer. Trevor has his hand raised. Pardon me. Trevor has his hand raised. Up in that corner. Hi, Trevor. Hi. How are you? Um, I just wanted to speak um, in favor of this bylaw. This was. Um, something I'd, I'd hoped would come about and I'm really grateful the board is, is moving in this direction. I think, um, you know, just uh, based on Nate's comments alone, this is exactly what I see. Uh, and also with, um, especially in this past year where um, people need to, you know, families used to live together and um, support each other, raising their children, taking care of their parents, taking care of an elderly. Um, there's so many reasons why we need to um, come back together as a community and as families together under one roof or multiple roofs. Um, but I just think the support of each other and their families, it, it's super important to have a space uh, to be able to, to bring mom or dad back home, you know, after one, maybe one passes away or as you have kids coming back after college and trying to get on their feet before they move on, having a space for them to do that, um, or caretake, you know, on a piece of property as, as others are moving around and doing different businesses. I think it does allow uh, one, a, a bit of an, a more affordable place to get younger families and all in, into here and also ways to take care of um, either elderly or hurt family or any other reasons that we need to pull together as families and, and as a community. So I'm, I'm really in favor of, of the bylaw. So just wanted to speak on that. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. <clears throat> Let's see, we have any other hands? Oh, uh, Jen? Hi, so um, the building commissioner and I were discussing this and we were saying that maybe a, a alternative to the way that the bylaw stands right now is to say that one of the units has to be owner occupied. So doesn't mean necessarily the where like me and his family are living right now or is it the accessory apartment? Just one of them has to be because then you know that somebody that's caring for the property is living there. Because the, the, the whole idea of having it owner occupied is that somebody is actually taking care of the property and maintaining it and um, will take care of snow removal and leave removal and, and maintenance issues that may come up. Because if both of the units are not owner occupied and it's just a to family rental and it there's no saying that there will be that maintenance level so just something to take into consideration because then it sort of makes it better for the situation 
um, that I think is Rhiannon is in at the moment. Uh, Chris. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's tricky business on this owner-occupied situation because I've actually lived this in my life a long time in California where I had properties there. And uh, because of work, I was abroad. And so I was leasing these places out furnished. And so obviously you have a high level of qualification for who you lease them to. And then you set up maintenance structures if you don't negotiate that with who's renting from them. But, you know, when you start looking at trying to maintain properties, you, you, there has to be some give and take here in terms of, of maintaining them and still getting enough income to do that high level of maintenance. So all I would say is it's, it's not just a straightforward deal on these types of things. I know it over the years, and then I've gone back to live at those properties. Um, and I, I feel like it's similar situation as the first person was talking about where ideally they want to come back to Deerfield someday, but they want to hold their property and maintain it and have flexibility in how they do that. So, um, so, so again, you know, owner occupied, I mean, in quotes, in terms of is it being owner managed is also important for these temporary interlude situations that I guess that's redundant that happen with, um, with, you know, you end up on a four year assignment somewhere, even it does happen. It's reality. Jen. So I've seen this in the past and a lot of times what happens is you have uh, a, somebody that's considered management for the property. So this is the rental um, registration program in the former town that I worked in. And so they would have a manager that was within 20 miles of the property that would need to fill out a paper and, and have a phone number that this paper needed to be posted for any resident that was living um, in either one of the homes um, in order for somebody to be able to e either, you know, if it's, let's say there's a fire there and they don't know who to contact because the owner records in, a, in another state. Um, or there's a maintenance issue or a pipe burst or, you know, on and on and on. There's so many things that can go on. So if there's somebody that's local within 20 miles that is certifying that they're going to be able to take care of this property, I can see um, the situation that you're saying, Chris Harris. But um, other than that, it's, it's like it's hard to say that somebody is going to manage their lease when they're thousands of miles away. Um, they just don't see what's happening currently at the at the property. Um, anyway, so that's my two cents. I, I work with thousands of rental properties. So, so it sounds like we've had um, a number of concerns about the owner occupied issue, and then also the question of whether or not a couple of the bylaws might be redundant in terms of the dimensions and size. Are there any other areas uh, um, concern, Chris? Mary has her hand raised. I'm gonna wait until after public comment, sorry. Thank you, Mary. Chris? No, the, only, the only other thing I had to say was, um, yeah, I mean, I totally am agreeing, sorry, I had my hand up before, sorry, Chris Curtis, but um, uh, the only thing is, I totally agree with the idea of documenting exactly who's in these properties at any time and having local um, management accessible, et cetera. Totally agree with that. It, you, you need to know who is in these properties for emergency purposes at all time. And that needs to, that needs to always be part of any, any situation where there's even a rental involved. I'll, I'll say as I believe, um, the sense exactly that in terms of having a registry, um, but it would not seem to be something that would be included in the, the bylaws. It would be more of a procedural um, thing. But yes, I we all feel very supportive of that. Chris Curtis, the other Chris. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to a couple of the questions and maybe try to clarify a couple of things. Um, on the issue of the uh, potential redundancy question in 3934, number six and number seven. 
Um, th those are not redundant. Um, number six is referring to the situation where there's an addition to an original building being proposed. And in that case, um, the addition has to um, not increase the, the floor area of the original building by more than 50%. Number seven is, is referring to um, accessory apartments, um, including those that might be within an existing building and the size of those um, must have a floor area not larger than half the floor area of the principal dwelling. So one's talking about additions and one's talking about the broader range of possibilities. So they're, they're not redundant in that regard. Um, in regard to the comment that um, the owner of the residence, um, one of the units must be owner occupied, um, but it could be either one of them. Uh, that is already actually provided for in the bylaw in 3934 number four where it says um, the owner of the residence in which the accessory apartment is located shall occupy at least one of the dwelling units on the premises. So we, we have addressed that um, question. Um, and I think, you know, in regard to the question about the owner occupied issue, uh, we've talked about this at, at some length. It's um, it's the intention of the bylaw to allow these accessory apartments in um, neighborhoods across town, including neighborhoods that are, have been traditionally single family um, neighborhoods. So we're introducing um, an apartment into a single family neighborhood in many cases. Um, we are trying to avoid the situation where we start having uh, multifamily housing in single family neighborhoods. Um, and the associated problems with that, where you don't have an owner occupancy, um, you potentially have issues of noise and loud music and all kinds of things like that, that you might have to deal with. So we felt, I think in the previous discussions anyway, that the owner occupancy requirement was really fundamental to um, allowing these to, to happen in neighborhoods where they wouldn't otherwise be allowed. For other circumstances, um, such as some of the ones that have been described, I would say the town has a, a provision for, for two, two family dwellings, um, and those are allowed by special permit, and, and uh, um, an owner could apply for a special permit in a circumstance like that to, to have a two family dwelling and to, to meet those standards, um, in which case the owner occupancy requirement would not be an issue. So I wanted to just try to address some of those questions. Robin? It's my understanding, and perhaps somebody from the town can correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time I checked, which was not super recently, I don't believe that a two family home was a use that was permitted by special permit in the district where we own our house. Can anybody speak to that? Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. yeah, we have no two families allowed in the residential agricultural area. Um, I believe it's only the central village area where you can do the two family, multifamily. I don't have my zoning book in front of me, but definitely not in the residential agricultural area, single family homes only. May I continue? Thank you, Robin. Sure. So with your permission, this, this I've been looking at this for a couple of years now. You know, and if there was a two family option, we'd be happy to apply for that option. I understand the theory behind owner occupancy, but I, I would submit, you know, and having lived on that property for four years, I can tell you that, you know, the home, some of the homes on our street were owner occupied, some were renter occupied. And it just happened to be that the noise problem came from an owner occupied unit. So I don't think that, you know, renters are any more or less likely to create problems than homeowners. I think it's really a matter of different individuals. And you know, I don't have a problem with the owner occupancy requirement. The problem, the concern that I have about this bylaw is it speaks to how often an owner needs to be present on their own property, which is certainly not 
Um, if this were a single family home and I was just renting it, you know, that's essentially the situation we have now, except their tenants don't pay rent. Um, you know, this would be adding an apartment that we could use. We're not planning to rent it. You could, you know, put a condition on it that says we can't rent it and we would, you know, accept that. Um, I don't see how that's different from renting out a single family house as opposed to a unit in a single family house. One way or the other, you're going to have a renter there and a renter may be noisy or a homeowner might be noisy. And I don't think that adding 900 square foot units to a few homes in Deerfield by special permit is going to fundamentally change the character of anybody's neighborhood especially if you have an owner occupancy requirement. The issue that I have is the town trying to control if we were to have an accessory apartment, how often we are there, because that's really a matter of people's individual circumstances. And, you know, one year we could be there, you know, seven months of the year and another year we could be there four months of the year. And that that's just recognizing the flexibility that people need in their lives. Thank you, Robin. Uh, yes, Jen. So I think Chris mentioned that before. You could have one of the unit as being owner occupied, and so it wouldn't be restrictive to the amount of time that you were there or not there. It that's how the bylaw reads right now. the The way the bylaw reads right now, it says that one of the owner units needs to be owner occupied, and it has to be occupied as a primary or permanent residence. And the owner has to be there except for bona fide, you know, legitimate absences. And that, that's the language that I have the concern about, not the requirement for owner occupancy. It's for saying it needs to be your permanent primary residence and you need to be there all the time except for bona fide reasons. Chris, can you speak on that behalf? Chris Curtis? Chris Curtis, yes. Um. <clears throat> Well, I, again, I, I guess I would just be repeating what I said earlier. Um, I think there's a legitimate reason for having that provision in the bylaw. And um, I, I mentioned it, uh, described it previously um, because we have many of these units would be going into um, primarily single family neighborhoods. It would be potentially changing the character of the neighborhood. Um, and that this is a provision to protect really the, the neighborhoods and the existing um, homes there. So we're writing the bylaw not to try to provide for individual, an individual circumstance like the one that's being described here, but really a, it's a bylaw that's intended to protect the town and a bylaw that's designed to address concerns of, of all the neighborhoods and the, and the residences in town, not, not just a, a, an individual circumstance. Jen? Also something to keep in mind is that I know that we're looking at, Robin, your situation, but everybody's situation is different. So how does a town write a bylaw that can help many people and not just one situation and also the evolution of time and the way that the town is going in the future. So we have to look at sort of things that can change and in, in what sort of environment we want for the town and how to be helpful to families that are now needing um, to, you know, have a situation that it's getting harder and harder to, to keep a home just by yourself. And so extended families are starting to move into town. And that's really the intent of this is to have those accessory apartments for um, multi-generational families living together. And it, it's a different situation when you become just a rental property and having the owner of the property living somewhere else and not managing it. And something that we've talked about in the past that isn't current, that could be in the future is having a rental bylaw um, in the town where you can register your property and have it um, have certain uh, regulations for health and safety and cleanliness. And so we, we've talked about that um, not at this point, but you know, moving in that direction. Well, I'll add to that, and then maybe Rachel, um, 
uh, we did have a, quite a bit of discussion about the scope of these bylaws, especially Chris, you had made some suggestions earlier in our process and um, there was recognition that we're, um, as, as Jennifer is saying, we're trying to have movement and um, make sure that the town is, is moving along at the same pace and the planning board is moving along at the same pace as the town. Rachel? I think that um, the, oh shoot, the, um, we want to be careful not to write a sort of a, a bylaw that makes it seem like we've changed the zoning um, into a two family households. So I think that that's what we're, we're really are in our intention. Now, I do, we did talk about registering various rental properties and that might actually serve this um, person, Robin, well, in the sense that that could be clarified in a statement of intention. I think that we're really not I mean, Tre Trevor's pointing out that it's great to have this. Well, we have had an accessory by, we have had this on the books. We're expanding something that was on the books. You could make a small apartment for your family member previously. We just couldn't do anything after the family member wasn't there anymore. Now we're making it so the family member moves on. You still have an apartment that is viable. It's not just a vestigial. Um, and I think that moving in that direction has been very positive, but I, I'm not sure that when we set out to create this, we were really creating a, a new, pro, a new, basically a new understanding of two, two family dwellings. And I don't think that's what you're really talking about here, Robin. I think you're really talking about this is yours and that's it, nobody else is moving into it. It's yours. It's not your primary in the sense that you're spending your most time there but it is only for you, that apartment, uh, the, the accessory part of the apartment. Denise? Yes, I, I was just thinking, so Robin, so you know, obviously you're in Alaska and you eventually want to move back. So if you did move back, wouldn't you want to move into your primary residence and then what would happen to the one that you would build? Robin? So I, I, will, I will get to your question. I'm sorry about the feedback. Um, I, I, before I do that, I want to observe that, you know, unless you are creating an accessory apartment in an existing structure, this is a special permit process. Um, and most single family homes are not big enough to create um, an accessory apartment. So most of them are requiring an addition. So having the special permit really allows the town an enormous amount of flexibility to control where these apartments go and what the conditions are on them. It's not like if you pass this bylaw, you suddenly have to issue special permits for any property in any um, district, in any situation in the town. Um, I do fully appreciate that you're trying to write a bylaw that is in the interest of most, you know, the whole town, the, uh, the town as a whole, and that you want to be careful to protect neighborhoods. That's all fine. But it's good to write a bylaw to give yourselves flexibility to respond to different circumstances. And you can write, you know, almost whatever conditions you want to, as long as they're reasonable in the permit. Denise, to answer your question, um, for the next you know, several years, while we both have elderly parents on both sides of the country, it's a little bit of a toss up, you know, how often we're gonna be at our property and when it's, it's just not entirely predictable. It's also not entirely predictable with respect to both of our careers. So that's why we're looking to have the opportunity to come and go for our property for a while. When we move back on a permanent basis, um, we would want to reoccupy our main house. Um, and at that time, you know, we could come to the, if we had an accessory apartment, we could come to the town and say, okay, now we want to rent this out or we want to change the use or fold it into our existing property. But right now, the way this bylaw is written, if we wanted to pursue this option, we really, the way the bylaw is written, we can't do that without saying, 
you know, we're going to move back first and make this our primary residence and commit to it. And my only option right now, we, we can't use our property while our caretakers are there. And they're doing a great job and we love having them there. And we don't want to say, sorry, you need to move so that we can come back to our house. We're going to put on an addition. And after that, you may be able to come back. And I understand that not everybody is in that situation and you don't want to write a bylaw for my individual situation. All I'm saying is people have very different circumstances. And if you write the bylaw to give whoever the permit agency is, whether it's the planning board or the zoning board of appeals and the building inspector, the flexibility to look at what kind of a neighborhood is this? Does an accessory apartment make sense? Do the neighbors have concerns about it? How do we address that in the permit? Um, and I think that the language you have now is sufficiently restrictive that it wouldn't help us in our situation. Um, so if we can't move back within a few years, we're just going to have to either sell our property or ask our caretakers to leave and rent our property. And then you really will be in the situation where you have renters and a distant owner who doesn't know what's going on on the property. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> Are there any other new comments or? Ann Mary has her hand raised. Oh, Ann Mary. Again, I will wait until you, it sounds like you're about to close public comment, so I'll just wait. I, I think so. Um, if uh, that's, I don't, uh, Gary? Almost. Almost, am I there? There you go. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but it seems like the issue isn't about the building. The issue is about who's going to come into your house and tell you what to do. And, you know, everybody does have a different thing going on in their life. And, and no two people here are going to have the exact same thing happening in their life. So how, how do you, you know, tell somebody what they can do and what they can't do with their own property? You know, if their family needs to be brought together, if, uh, this woman here who has a caretaker. I mean, all these things are all valid and, and everybody's gonna have to deal with, with what comes into their own life. And it seems like there's part of this bylaw that is kind of taking it, going into people's rights. Like somebody's gotta go into somebody's home and tell them that they can or they can't do something. And, and that, that becomes a very touchy issue, I think. And uh, if there could be a way to, you know, work it from the outside in instead of the inside out, it, it might be a little easier for people to digest and, and go along. Um, but, you know, it, it, like I said, every, everybody's going to have their own issues and, and they're going to have to deal with them in their own personal way. And how, how far is the government going to come in and and help us out. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you all for all the work you do here. People don't realize how hard it is. We, we like to have people show up, that's for sure. Um, all right, um, I think that it seems that we've had um, some pretty thorough conversation with the people who are here. Um, I think unless there's um, more, burning issues if I could have a motion to close the public hearing. I move that we close the public hearing. Thank you, Anne Mary. <clears throat> a second. I second that Denise, Denise Tracy. Tracy. Second, thank you. And any more discussion about closing the public hearing? Um, Okay, so uh, we'll have a vote on closing the public hearing. Uh, Rachel? Rachel Blaine, aye. Anne Mary Cloutier? Anne Mary Cloutier, aye. We're all getting good at reading lips here. <laughs> Denise, Denise Mason? Denise Mason, aye. And Kathy Watroba? Kathy Watroba, aye. Annalie Wolfcool, aye. Max Antes? Max Antes, aye. 
Okay, so we'll close the public hearing by unanimous vote. And so now we will, so thank you all for participating too. I, I think that they were some, we had some very clear and well thought out comments. Um, so now we will, I believe the next thing is to actually have a deliberation on um, the, the bylaws and if in fact there are some admit, uh, amendments that we feel should be um, made to the bylaws as they stand. So this would be discussion um, with the planning board and um, you know, with the planning board, <laughs> I don't know. I, I would like to respond because I, I really want to bring us back to purpose. The num number one is to provide homeowners with a means of obtaining through tenants and accessory dwellings, rental income, companionship, security and services, and thereby to enable them to stay more comfortably in homes and neighborhoods they might otherwise be forced to leave. This my draft says March 21st, and I think I'm looking at the most current draft. And if that's the purpose of this law, then I feel like this conversation may have taken us in a different direction from the intention of the law, which isn't a rental bylaw, right? It's an accessory apartment. And maybe I have a misunderstanding about that, but I think that that would be governed by a whole separate section. So we're not trying to create a rental bylaw, we're trying to create an accessory dwelling towards the purpose that's stated, right? Um, and, you know, I have lived abroad, I've owned property here in the United States while living abroad. Um, I understand the um, particulars of being away and having a management company and do you rent, do you leave it empty? I understand that. And where do you come home to when your contract is over? But once again, I'm not sure that this law is written towards this purpose. Um, so I understand the, you know, feeling stymied like that, but I guess as a board, I want us to really stay on track for who this, this law is written for. It's written for low income. It's written to keep families together. It's written, you know, for more than, you know, really just kind of one person um, and their particular situation. And I want them to stay, like I want them to be part of our community. And I certainly, you know, um, but I feel the purpose of the law may be different than the purpose of the letter that we received and the purpose of you know the people who've spoken here tonight. Thank you, Anne Mary. <clears throat> Some other comments, um, Kathy. I fully agree with that. Uh, in my notes, I wrote, "What is the purpose of the accessory apartment?" <laughs> and the purpose is to help individuals, right? So they used to be called in-law apartments. So that's what they used to be called. And that phrase says an awful lot, right? So family stayed within a home. And, you know, when you have elderly parents that are on a fixed income and you have a young family who can't afford to buy a house and it's a, it's a nice and it's a safe community, you know, this is a way to meet those needs. And I think, you know, we need to focus on this community, the community of Deerfield. What are the needs that we're trying to meet within this community? Um, and stay focused on the purpose. What is our purpose and what is our goal for the accessory apartment? I mean, I think there are extenuating circumstances that can really go in an awful lot of directions. And, you know, one of the terms that was used was flexibility. You know, what is the flexibility? But that's a defined term too. I mean, we can define legitimate, we can define bona fide, we can define flexibility too. Like we can do this all day long. So I think we have to, stay focused on what our goal is, which is the accessory apartment, allowing affordable housing, staying within families and not, you know, being careful how far we go out. I think Rachel Blaine also brought up a point about zoning. I mean, that's, that's another piece that will um, come into play as it relates to where we can do this and how it's going to be done. And, and, you know, again, back to staying focused on it, the purpose, our community, and and uh, what, how we can support the families that are presently here. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Other comments? I think I'll add that um, the comment of um, trying not to have these 
properties that have more than one unit on them um, just become rental properties that resonated with me. Uh, Rachel. Well, and one other concern too, I think um, I'm not entirely sure why the, anyway, you, we have a parking issue. This was a, brought up last time and we talked about it very briefly. And if you start to have, you know, parking is kind of um, something that is worked out with, with people who live together, <laughs> who have a relationship and in this accessory apartment um, situation. And I think this is a good example, but there are many examples that will be working out their parking relationship with the two that there's not a, you know, it's not a, a generous parking explanation. We have, we have a parking like section. I don't know what section it is. Anyway, these are the kinds of things that need to be worked out with an owner, with somebody who's the owner who's working it through. And um, that's just another concern came up last meeting. And I think it is another um, pointer toward making certain that it, this does stay kind of in the realm of accessory apartments for now. I mean, if we're changing zoning, we're changing zoning, but if um, this is a, a different bird of a different feather. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Um, are there other comments from the planning board? All right, then um, I think we would have a motion to, well, I believe it would be a motion to uh, place the bylaw on the warrant as written for town meeting without, and at this point we're not, to my knowledge, um, we did talk some about some redundancies with, which Chris clarified. Um, I don't think there are any other um, edits that we're suggesting, are there? Am I overlooking Chris maybe? Is there any, are there any edits that, last minute edits that I'm missing or Rachel? Well, we're not putting any, um, last week, Lisa suggested we put something in about, or was it a separate bylaw about a uh, registry of rental properties? My understanding was that we would have that be something that we would address internally with town administration and have it be, I don't know, part of the process. Jen, I don't know if you can address that or Chris. Didn't she suggest? Chris, do you want to speak on that? Well, on the first question, um, there aren't any additional um, edits or changes that need to be made to my knowledge. Um, in terms of the registration for um, two family dwellings or rental units, I do think that was discussed as, a, as another separate bylaw that could be considered at a future date by the planning board and you, you might want to engage Jennifer or myself in, in helping to craft that, but I think that's a separate discussion um, in a future bylaw. Agreed. Thank you. All right, thank you. Stand corrected. <clears throat> All right, so we would be um, make, having a motion to place this bylaw as stated on warrant for town meeting. I believe that's the, the... Yeah, I think that's the verbiage. So I'll I'll make I'll make a motion to place the bylaw as written on the warrant for town meeting. Thank you, Rachel. Um, or Anne Mary, do we have a second? I'll second it. Then that's for the Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> so um, we will. Uh, is there any more further discussion? Okay. So um, we'll vote. Um, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, aye. Anne Mary Cloutier. Anne Mary Cloutier, aye. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, aye. Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba, aye. Annalie Wolf Cool, aye. Max Antes. No, Max Antes, no. Okay, so the motion passes. Uh, is it five one zero? Is that correct? No, there's six of us here. All right, thank you. And thank you again to um, everyone who participated in the conversation. I, I was really impressed with the thought, the thought of it.
Um, new business. Um, and we do have representatives, members of our select board to uh, present the um, discussion of the um, proposed bylaw. It is on our agenda that you all received and um, it would be something that I understand uh, planning board will be would be presenting to the town at the town meeting. So um, even though it didn't originate with us. So um, uh, Trevor and and or sure. Carolyn, whoever wants to go first, Trevor. Um, <laughs> yeah, K Casey's here as well uh, to speak on the issue. And so uh, we, we were hoping, and, I, and I'll, I'll just make a statement and let, let Carolyn and uh, Casey take over. This was um, a request we were gonna make through uh, to the planning board. We have quite a few projects coming forward from the town um, that may require some alterations to um, frontage or um, setbacks. And we, we felt um, while we wanted to um, have some flexibility, we did want to have oversight, uh, not something that the select board would just move ahead on on any whim, but to have um, partnership with the planning board in, in deciding these matters. So um, many towns ask for um, some relief from certain zoning requirements um, when it comes to municipal, municipal projects. And uh, this is one area that we would like to, to do that. I think I'd let, you know, Casey and, and Carolyn were a little bit more involved with that. So maybe I'll pass the baton. Yeah. Well, there really isn't, um, I mean, we just have a, um, a multitude of projects potentially coming down, um, you know, uh, the library project, senior center, um, the church, um, the, the library, if we, if we go forward with the library, we have to find a temporary spot. So, um, you know, Cumberland Farms had been suggested and, um, you know, we have senior housing, we have the park. So we, we decided what we would not ask for, we would can have the same setbacks that already exist because most, most of the projects are gonna be in the South Deerfield Village District, which has a 25 foot setback. So what we decided to do was just take project by project on the setbacks and just maintain the 25 foot setback. But um, the frontage um, we would like to have reduced to 50 feet. So, which is essentially um, access and, um, and, and just go from there. Um, the idea is to have some flexibility. So I didn't. I don't know if you have any questions or. Um, I'll I'll just say here. Thank you, Carolyn and Trevor, but um, for explaining because I did have it was a little bit difficult for me to really understand what was going on. So the setbacks are on the three sides that aren't in the front, correct? <laughs> right. Right. And then what is the current and the current frontage requirements? Are I believe it's in the Central Village District is a hundred. Okay. So we're as asking to go down to fifty feet, which is essentially, which is essentially a like a subdivision bylaw. I mean, you know, subdivision road. And oh, <laughs> Casey, <laughs> she just remembered something she needs to do. Um, uh, but you were saying with the setbacks that those potentially, if there were issues, could be addressed on a case by case basis. Why right. would it not be the same the, for the front? Pl the planning board would be the one to decide. Mm -hmm. We would take it to the planning board to decide. All right. You know, we well, like Cumberland Farms, is, you know, it's pre existing building. So we would come for a site, site plan review and, uh, you know, we'd have to get a change of use. Um, because it's been vacant already for two years. So, um, you know, that isn't going to meet the setback requirements. So um, that, that, and of course, that's only if we buy it and it becomes potentially the library, um, you know, temporary library spot. But the idea is that, you know, there was just too many, I mean, we, we just didn't need to worry about the setbacks because the setbacks, like I said, would do depending on what we're doing. I mean, we don't really know what we're going to do with the church and the senior center yet. Um, you know, we're still in the process. 
Um, but we know we need access to Brayburn. We know we need access to the park. Um, we know we need access to, you know, different potential projects that we have coming down the line. I'm sorry again for my challenge with this access versus frontage. I mean, this is well, yeah. Well, the frontage instead of having a hundred feet, you would you would essentially reduce it to fifty, which is access, is to allow enough space for an access. And you would prefer to have that as a overall bylaw rather than a case by case as a set box would right. be. Right. Yes. That's correct. Casey, do you want to add to this discussion? It's really for municip municipal facilities. And like Carolyn said, there's a lot of projects that are sort of lining up in a queue that we can all see. And I had, I lost my notes. I had a note and it said Braeburn on it, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> right. I couldn't remember. So thank you for filling in that blank. But there's certainly access may be challenging for Braeburn and has been for years. So things like that could allow the town to proceed with, with oversight. And I think that was the main thing that the board discussed right. in many of the conversations we had, certainly with, with council was maintaining that oversight and collaboration with the planning board. And if necessary um, for other permit, with other permit granting authorities. And Casey, as you've mentioned, council. Um, so council has looked at this. Yes. Okay. Council has reviewed it, and this was the language that was discussed. Thank and she's once the board approved it, that's what you received is the language that was discussed with her. Thank you. All right. Other yes, Denise. I just had a question. So, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know all the different. Oh, you know what? Sorry, I have these little for barometric pressure <laughs> earplugs and I forgot. <laughs> Why am I having a hard time hearing? Um, at any rate, so if you're talking about um, access and 50, so if, instead of 100 feet, 50 feet, so it gives more access to get in there, maybe you have to widen a road or, or something. So does that have any impact on adjacent, uh, existing adjacent residential buildings? Would that be an issue at all for people? So, you know, Braeburn, I know that, you know, I don't know how many houses, but I know there's some homes. Is that going to affect anybody else's property? Well, we'd have to, you know, what we were gonna do was buy a property or have a donation of a property. So, you know, obviously if you build um, access road, it would have, you, you would have a um, adjacent properties. Right. So, I mean, that, that's my question, you know, is, is it going to impact someone's property, someone's home? For instance, the, the, the park that's, that eventually is going to be built, is that going, is this something that would impact people's property? No, it won't take anybody's property or impact it. We would just still, still be on our own property that we own. Right. Um, but it would allow us access in for properties, yeah, for municipal projects. Okay, but but is it also with new construction on those municipal properties that it would the setback wouldn't have to be the same? Is that correct? That it would only have to be fifty well, instead of hundred? I'm just trying to frontage. Yes, visualize. frontage. Frontage would allow us uh, fifty instead of a normal hundred mm -hmm. uh, for municipal projects. Um, but it, uh, setbacks, if we if we had to change a setback or request a setback, we would only do that coming before your board and your board would only be the only one that would have the authority to approve right. that. So it wouldn't be something the select board would just do. Uh, Jen? Yeah, I was just gonna say that it goes through regular site plan review process and the select board, I mean, sorry, the planning board would view all of the plans. I mean, it would just say that, let's say you had a property that was, you know, for, I was saying this example earlier, 59, 50 feet, but it was 49, you know, it wouldn't be able to be there, but by giving that, or a hundred feet, now you're saying, yeah, 50 feet, we could actually have a different use there, but they would still have to go through site plan review process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Still, you can still put a subdivision road in with 50 feet, but mm -hmm. you would yeah. not have to 
yeah. actually put the subdivision road in to gain your frontage. Okay. I mean, Thanks. that's the difference. If we, in the park property, we can put a subdivision road in and then the frontage is off the um, subdivision road. But this would allow us not to have to put the subdivision road in and to gain the 100 feet of, mm -hmm. in other words, we wouldn't have to go in and put a cul-de-sac in at um, in the park to get our 100 foot um, frontage. It would just give us a 50 foot, you know, access. And that's, excuse me, go on. Sorry. I'm sorry. So, so if it's currently 100 feet and you want to change it to 50 feet, isn't the 50 feet already absorbed in there, right? If it were originally 100 feet, we're bringing it to 50 feet. So that other 50 feet is already absorbed in that. that uh, no, what we're saying is we, we would, the minimum frontage would be 50 feet. Mm -hmm. We would not have to put the subdivision road in to gain our frontage. Mm -hmm. We would just be allowed to have frontage of 50 feet for a municipal project. So, okay. so and, and I, the clearest explanation is if, if we were gonna build senior housing um, in the park place mm -hmm. instead of um, the park, we would put a subdivision <laughs> road in and then you would build your housing off the, your frontage would become off your whatever road you built into the that property. Yeah. And, and as the park, we could put a subdivision road in and you have your cul-de-sac and then you would therefore get your 100 foot of frontage. But we don't want to build a cul-de-sac in the park. Mm -hmm. We get our front 100 foot frontage. Or off Brayburn. Right, I was gonna know, say. We don't want to put the cold, go in with just the subdivision road and, and then build off of that. We would like some flexibility if we were going to put, um, you know, soccer fields out there. We don't want to have to build a, um, a subdivision road with a cul-de-sac to get our hundred foot of frontage to put soccer fields on, on Brayburn or senior housing or whatever. It gives, just gives us more flexibility. Sure. Because you can always, you only need 50 feet uh -huh. to do your subdivision road or whatever the, you know, whatever it takes, but you have to have then put your cul-de-sac on or your, you know, or keep running it to um, get your frontage. And also the planning board it has the right through the site plan review process to, you know, make some other suggestions for the plans like um, screening versus, you know, for your plantings or, you know, you know, all of those things are still in play uh, to help with it. It just, like Carolyn was saying, gives more flexibility um, for municipal projects on municipal facilities uh, that would make it more appealing for the neighbors and the project. You know, it, it, by right, you just you can just put your subdivision road in, and and that you know there's no other oversight. But you know that does cost money to put in a um, you know subdivision road when you, especially if you don't need it. So, you know, we're, we're just looking for flexibility of not putting in the subdivision um, road. And then, you know, like, like Jen had said, you can put require screening or whatever it is because of, then you're, it's just part of the project. It's not by right. <clears throat> Are there other questions? I mean, my understanding of our discussion tonight is that we would be taking a vote on this verbiage to bring it forward to a public hearing. That Correct. is what our next step That's would be. So this isn't necessarily our final. Our final no, this is just to put it on the public hearing or go through the public hearing process. So we would, Annalie, you know that chart like I gave you where we would put the dates in. That's what it would start that process. Good chart, good chart. <laughs> All right. Casey's are chart. Other, are there other questions or comments? I don't see any. All right, so if I could have a motion to um, bring um, this uh, uh, bylaw change, change, by change 
to um, a public hearing and then we will vote or determine what the date of the public hearing would be. So I need a motion. I make a motion to bring this change to the bylaw to the public hearing. Thank you, Denise. Denise Mason. And the second? I second. Thank you, Kathy. Here. <clears throat> I can remember people's. Uh, so, uh, any other discussion? Can I ask? Yes. Here. Discussion. Yeah. What are we moving to do? Moving to change um, setbacks and. No. Not setbacks. Frontage. Just. Frontage in municipal facilities. Okay. Yeah, the setbacks are going to remain the same. Yeah. And, right. we, and, and it would allow us requests to come before the planning board to change them if needed, All right. depending on the project. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And we're just deciding that we're going to open a public hearing. I don't even That's think all. we don't need to vote for it that we just oh. yeah. decide oh. the public hearing. We need to schedule it is that's where Jennifer comes in. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> but for purposes, we wanted to have a brief discussion with you all and let you know where, where what we were thinking about it. And Annalie, you had asked if you know some of us could come and visit with you on it. So well, that's where the that's you know, what we would like to do. Yeah, it, the I hearing mean, process would go through the administrative. We, yeah, we just wanted to explain that we wanted a little bit of flexibility versus um, being forced to do certain things. So really, what it's doing is is um, making a change to the dimensional requirement, like our chart that we have in our zoning bylaw. And it would be in the notes. <laughs> in the notes. <laughs> and it would be limited to municipal projects. Yeah, I'm not sure that it actually is footnote nine because we already have a footnote nine, 10 and 11. So anyway. it's adding a new superscript nine Super that allows for municipal facilities to, to have that notation in the language that's in the second paragraph okay so there you go huh. <clears throat> all right <clears throat> so any more discussion well i guess what we're saying that in fact we don't have to vote to take it to public right. meeting, yep it's up to the chair to put it on the board on the, on the schedule okay so, but so we i would believe annalee that our the next meeting is fairly full and plus we have to have notice of posting Quite full. Right. So, um, and then the following um, week is our um, town meeting. So we don't have a meeting then, and we haven't really um, put it out farther than that. Election, you mean? I mean, yes. I'm sorry. The election, right? So our um, the, the meeting after that, if we were to try to have replace our regularly scheduled meeting, um, it would be on. Um, May 10th, is that Monday, May 10th? Does that work for people? Casey, does that give us enough time before June? I think it would, right? Yes. Yeah. I think so. Perfect. Yeah, it gives us a month. Okay. The, since, since town meeting is June 12th, that should give us enough time. Great. Okay. If it's, if it's approved. Yeah, right, correct. Yeah, correct. Or no significant change right once it goes through the hearing process it has to go through the hearing process and the planning board has to make a decision yep. after the hearing okay. uh, trevor and casey and carolyn it was a much better informed conversation having you come so oh <laughs> thank you for having us this is no problem so much stuff going on it's hard to keep up annalee right right all right so um i think that's it for this um Part of new business. Um, next item on new business is um, talking about uh, new planning board member orientation. Denise? Yeah, thanks, Annalie. I know Annalie and I, since we're both still new, we've just been on for a year, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, we hear bits and pieces, and I know we have, you know, we had. Um, Oh, we had a couple of trainings, but you know, I'm just when individuals who are running for the planning board ask, well, well, what do you do? Is there orientation? Is there training? You know, it was it was sort of hard to answer that <laughs> because it is somewhat limited. And so I think, you know, I 
we were talking about it would be nice to have maybe more of a I shouldn't say standard, but more of a more of a standard orientation, a little bit more to that. And in addition to that, you know, getting information. I know we talked about this before. Different training, you know, different training. That's I know that FERCOG FERCOG does some, but I mean, I looked at some, and I don't think it's what they're doing is not necessarily relevant to the planning board. Maybe some. So it would be great to have alerts to that, you know, in you know timely manner, so that we could participate. And then the other thing is, I know we've talked about, you just said it, that Jen, you gave Anna Lee um, a procedural paper on, I'd like to see all of that. And Rachel, you said that you have a book from however many years ago, and who else has something? Oh, and then Anna Lee mentioned that, and Mary, that you had something. So. I would be willing to, to conduct a work group to look at all of this and try and put something together, a little comprehensive orientation and just other training material, you know, other, you know, cheat sheets, basically. Because um, I did give Annalie a cheat sheet on um, uh, Robert's Rules of Order. So, you know, things like that, I think are really useful for us to have, instead of having to dig into the zoning bylaws for every single thing. Sorry, Jen. 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 Well, I was just going to say, I think the select board um, would be very supportive of having, um, you know, um, a land use little seminar uh, of an hour or two um, with our land use lawyer just to go over some really common things. I, I know from my um, almost 20 years on the planning board, um, you know, you get an awful lot of experience over the years, but you know, you, you just forget things because not you don't have a lot of um, applications that come in on a regular basis. So um, I think a couple hours every year um, with our town lawyer, just going over some of the basics, just mm -hmm. review is really, really important. And, um, and then you're not, then everybody's on the same page or starts with the same page. And so just like every July, you know, you, you have a, you know, a little get together or something and it just, or set up a date that is regular after, you know, um, election. So you have, you know, you, you capture everybody and, and the July is usually the new fiscal year. So if you did something after, you know, the elections and then the new fiscal year and you budget it, for that every year or put it in our budget for, you know, under legal expense. I think that's a very good idea. And then, but I'm not suggesting what you're not doing is a good idea is to pull things together. Like Jen can put stuff together because she's had some experience and you can pull it together, but then, and then, then you're informed a little bit to ask, the, you know, a land use lawyer for um, a dis further discussion. Right. Jen? Yeah. So, um, the CC, I think it's CCPT, it, they have a training, it's, um, and it's yep. very informative. I've been to it, and unfortunately, I left my, I, did, I thought I was leaving municipal work, but here I am. Um, and it, it's very informative for board members to go to, so we would just need to put that into our budgets about going to those types of training. I also think that it's important the um, the book that Rachel said that she used to get that each new planning board member gets a book that has our zoning bylaw on it, has our general bylaw in it, has um, the um, uh, why is it? What did you say, Denise? Um, what you said, Anna, that you gave to Annalie. I'm oh, oh the, the, a cheat sheet on Robert's oh, the cheat sheet. Yes. Sorry, sorry, thank oh. you. Robert's rules, like that it has yeah. all of those. It also has every single one of the applications that yes. the board is having to review and yes. the requirements for each of those applications. And we should have a meeting prior to the person have it going to their first planning board meeting so that they understand and everything is in one binder. Um, we've yes. sort of been sort of piecemealing it together and Annalie has been calling and checking in with all of us and she's doing a great job. Thank you, Annalie. Um, because, you know, we're, 
we don't have our planner, but we're doing the best that we we can <laughs> um, to get all the information for the planning board. But I think that that's important to move forward. And I'm willing to work with you, Denise, in, in oh, gathering right. all that information so that cool. we can get binders and give it to people. And you know whether it's something that becomes a agenda item for every planning board meeting to say, okay, it, whether it's somebody on the board or staff, um, that looks to see what trainings are coming up and how much they're gonna cost. And so that that can be part of um, our discussions right now. Um, we're trying to get our feet on the ground running and we there was talk about having particular meetings on one date and then um, you know growth meetings for the, the planning board planning um, other activities on another meeting, you know, if we met twice a month. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, then you could do those type of administrative things on that second day. But I'm right. very- Well, you know, um, another thing, Jen, I mean, and you talked about, it, and I'm not sure whether this was the, the timing for like an ANR and, you know, when you receive it, how many days, you know, that cheat sheet, sort of the flow chart, I think is great. I'm all about, I love timelines. Yes. I like to know here we are today, where do we, where, and what do we have to achieve in between? Yeah, and so there's I think many things that are different depending whether it's a public hearing or a public yeah. meeting and, and the difference between an A&R and &R what you all have to know as far as what you're looking at in those maps mm -hmm. um, as far as setbacks and area and frontage. And I mean, there's only so much, I mean, we have to enforce it as town officials and that's our, we're trying to help you guide it. Um, but just making it, um, at your fingertips so that you all can do the research would be wonderful. Um, Rachel and Mary and Max, as all three of you are approaching your busy seasons with uh, end of school and planting season, how could you um, help uh, to those of us who don't know, we don't know what we don't know. So, you know, Rachel has this big binder. I mean, could we borrow your binder, how, how can we pick your brains at a time when your brain is frizzled? <laughs> I did get the binder. There was a binder that was in Sue's office, so she has it. So we just have to weed out the old things and make a new thing. Like it doesn't have to, that can just sort of be a guide for what we um, can use, like what was in it in the past, but really a lot of that information is outdated. So to gather all new information and I can work with Denise and, and make something that we can have a index um, that whenever a new board member comes in, it's all refreshed. So then you take out your bad, you know, the sections that are, let's say our zoning bylaw is gonna change, right? So we have to um, um, take out the old bylaw and put in the new bylaw, you know? So that should be something that's done periodically so we don't have outdated Binders. I'm ready when you are. <laughs> Whenever we can, we can talk. You know, yeah, and figure there. something out. I'm there every day. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we can set up a time. I mean, I I have a lot of time on my hands now, so obviously, you know, you don't. So you know, we can we can work out whatever. And I don't I don't recall Annalie what you said that Anne Mary you have some useful information too. I don't remember. I think uh, Anne Mary had mentioned. <laughs> some uh, flow charts on um, how to go through site plan review and, and whatnot, so. Yeah, Jennifer and I have talked about that in the past and just like creating systems so that nothing falls through the cracks. And so we yep. make sure that we're asking for everything and we're dotting our I's and crossing right. our T's. Yeah. That would be I great. Have a, I have a feeling that this will be the first of maybe many iterations, but it'll be good to get yeah. something. So, you know, Annalie, I mean, I, I think it would be beneficial for all of us, not only planning board members, but also town employees. So, I mean, granted, I agree, you're doing a great job, Annalie, but, you know, it may reduce the phone calls and the emails back and forth. So it's that we a learning curve. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely a learning curve and right. just a process and trying to make sure that we get a lot of these details ahead of time so that the planning board has a very um, clear view of what they're looking at when it comes to the yep. board. And I never got a folder, a binder, so I would, yeah. you know, love A lot it. of people didn't. 
that's the yeah. first time. Pat, Smith, <laughs> Pat Smith put this together for us. Yeah. That's how old it is. We'll, we'll get new binders. We'll, it wasn't. Uh, it was a one-time only sale. Twenty thirteen. What's in it, Rachel? That's the question. No, we did it back in the eighties. Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, that was just. I think I have it, my old it? cheat sheets here somewhere. <laughs> well, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you. I think it'll be great. All right. So. Um, in terms of since since we're really talking about process here, if uh, Denise and Jen um, send us updates, because it otherwise it looks like we may not be able to have a real conversation about this again until the May tenth meeting, because I think the April twenty sixth is going to be pretty full. Yeah. Well, why don't you just contact me, Denise? So we can make a time to meet and sort of make a you know a checklist of sure. what would need to be in the binder, and we can you know I could loop Sue in and she can help also gather this information. So even if we have it on our S drive and has all the documents there in a list mm -hmm. and it's easy to then go and print them out when we have new board members. Okay, sounds great, thanks. Okay. And since this is procedural, I don't think we're uh, struggling with open meeting laws in terms just of- Just a work group. Right, right. Well, I'll just be working with Denise and then we can present it at another meeting if it's on the agenda. Yeah, we we'll, we okay. may well we should have some new members in at our June meeting. So, yeah, <laughs> Kathy can be in charge of orientation since you had such a good one, right, Kathy? Sure. <laughs> She's there. She's there. Okay. Um, is there any other business not reasonably anticipated forty hours prior? Not that I know of. Can I, I just have a question. I know this was on the agenda last time and we did talk and, and I'm going to work with Anne Mary and is it Karen? Karen on the Bloody Brook planning, clean up with the source to see. But I was just curious if anybody else had joined in that effort so far. And I think Trevor was also. Um, <laughs> no one has reached out to me, but I implore anyone, you know, we're gonna be talking Wednesday evening. Um, and if you reach out to me, I'm happy to send you an invite. I would love to hear from. I got the invite. I just wanted to let you know that I um, I should be able to make it, but I've got also a public hearing for the Deerfield school budget that night. No so I will be there. I will be there before that. So I okay. should be able to stay for a bit. So. All right, Anne Marie, if you um, uh, Anne Marie, if you send me a um, invite, I will come uh, um, as a mosquito district commissioner. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> did, any, did, did everybody hear what our mascot's going to be? Uh, a dragonfly, because dragonflies uh, eat mosquitoes. I know. I love dragonflies. Right, Carolyn? Yes. They eat about 100 mosquitoes a day. That's yeah. Our, that's our yeah. opt out plan if anyone wants With to. The little beer stein. <laughs> oh, <laughs> perfect. That's my other idea. We no, I'm, I'm kidding. Mountain. Um, with a deer fly and a candle and a beer and <laughs> which oh, Carolyn was asking us about right what us. we could do for an emblem. <laughs> so we were brainstorming the seal with a dragonfly or sugarloaf with a dragonfly. I love the dragonfly idea. I'm hundred percent behind that. Yeah. So all we got to do is find somebody who can draw. So, so Trevor, I need you to find out the person because I sent an email and nobody responded to me because I would like to do a mural on a wall that I've gotten permission from the store owner or the building owner to put a mural up. And wouldn't it be great to put a dragonfly and people can do their little selfies with the dragonfly wings behind them. Love it. Like yeah. an art scene. So I, so I we, it's a great idea and it's a very not pretty space. So that can we go cool. on the town website and ask for submissions and like, yeah. Well, I was thinking we could get one of the students from the schools. And so I reached yeah. out and, but nobody returned my, yes. but I got the business owner to agree to it. And the, and the business, no, the owner of the property agreed to it. And then the business owner agreed to it. So we're, a, we're like good to go for that, but we cool. then need to paint it and then get this, an artist to, to do it. And we thought a student would be wonderful. I know just this student and I will reach out. And to her. Then on my way because this is I sure we're will. getting it done. All right. But if we made it put it out there on Facebook, <laughs> oh, yeah. 
I agree with Anne Mary. I agree with Anne Mary. Let's then, post it on Facebook. Then it might be a little bit more wouldnable if anybody else wanted a shot. Just say right. All right. right. So that's right. what we have to talk about tomorrow, Jennifer. Right. Okay. okay. We'll talk about it later. Here, I'm getting all excited. And I want to know what building. <laughs> Can I tell you? Yes. Um, the the where the pizza plate Primos is. Primos is. I have been fantasizing next about to, that. I'm so psyched. Oh. Next to Cumberland Farms, the, uh, the right, right. Cumberland Farms. So there's that big wall. Oh, so that would be I reached great. out to the owner and then the owner's dad manages it. And he said that his nice. they, they're willing to do that. And then the primos agreed also that they don't mind. And I think, yeah. That's awesome. Like so awesome. if you go and look, um, Oh gosh, Casey, I'm terrible at this. What's the name of the place across the bridge that we get our sandwich, like to sandwiches? Shh. Um, bridge, bridge. No, oh, no, 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 no. Which side? No. Oh, you mean on this side? Roots. Wild but, Roots? Wild Roots. Yeah, Wild Roots. Wild Roots. So, Wild Roots just went to Greenfield and they put a butterfly on their building in Greenfield. And so then I thought, oh, dragonfly. Yes. In <laughs> In Deerfield, oh, Brooklyn, and so an idea. I told you about dragonflies. <laughs> I'm doing too much now. But it's anymore. a great spot to take selfies because you're selfies. right there. Yeah. Well, and in I was getting I food at, at Gianni Figs and turned around and looked at it the other night and went, "She's right. That needs to be painted." <laughs> I was driving home one day and I go, oh, "That's a good mural wall. It's great. All Something right. simple." Have you? You've, so, you must yeah. have seen the uh, crow on the side of the Salvation Army building. Next to Hope and Olive, I love that. Yes. It's so it's so yes. simple, but it's so nice. So. All right, Yay. excellent. Good enthusiasm. Good, good. good oh, dear, Bill. Extra. I know. All right, so we will get dragonflies. We are having three public hearings on the twenty sixth on solar site review, site plan review bylaws, and treehouse brewing brewery. Mm -hmm. So everybody's gonna have fun reading between now and then. And then on the 10th, we will have our frontage public hearing and most likely I would imagine some follow-up for Treehouse and whatever else. Um, Jen? Yeah, I was just making a suggestion of your plate. If you wanna make a placement, Casey, did, would that matter? Which way that they hear those on the agenda? Say that again, Jennifer. Is there an importance of placement on the agenda? Like if they put treehouse first and then did the bylaws after, or do you think that it should be the bylaws and then treehouse? I think it's up to be honest with you. Um, usually the chair approves the agenda. So, so I would decides. It's what I do with Carolyn and I usually consult on those things. And when okay. Trevor was chair, Trevor and I consulted on those things. Okay. Just to keep that in mind. All right. Sir. Thank you. Did, did right. tree, oh, I'm sorry. Did Treehouse say how long their presentation would take? That may make a difference. Well, they're going to be they're going to be presenting on the 13th for the select. Oh, right. So yes. I right. highly encourage Mara. everybody to yeah. go and watch that and have an overview, and then to read the packet that's been left out in the foyer for all the planning board members. It's very good and it's very informative and complete. Um, as far as requirements that are on our application. So I think that if, if that's all researched ahead of time, a lot of your questions will be answered. Um, we have a public hearing at six o'clock for the Capital Improvement Committee. So I would say Treehouse is anywhere between um, 6.30 and quarter yeah. seven probably. Okay. Would be, yeah, would yeah. be they would be coming for- On the uh, 13th. Yeah. Right. Tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Oh, yeah. Oh God, that's right. It's tomorrow. Right. I know it's the twelfth. <laughs> I didn't even realize it was the twelfth until today. Season. No, I had, April's no, I, apparently half right. over. Right. No, I have that meeting already. I've got it. Yeah, in my calendar. All right. Um. So do we have a motion to adjourn? Uh, and I move that we adjourn. Oh, I second it. Okay. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 I, I applaud your enthusiasm, Rachel. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank Have you. a nice night, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.